ladies and gentlemen, I hope you hear me. Let me hear, let me see your reaction. Lovely, thank you so much. So you know, it's just uh, two hours and 15 seconds, and we need to start our little marathon. I call it marathon because we have several excellent speakers with us, and I would like to take you to what we're going to do. Uh, so, do, do you hear me? Please, you know, please uh, show, show your reaction, you know. Do I have to restart? Oh my God. This shows, once again, the importance of technology for achieving our goals. Okay, summed up? All right, so now it is uh, two hours and one minute. So uh, we are going to start a session that will focusing on the decade of ocean science for sustainable development and how it's going to address ocean biodiversity. Oh la 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 la. So thank you for your reaction and your understanding. So we... You know, I need to keep speaking, I think, because otherwise you won't be able to, to understand the difference. So, uh, when, as soon as uh, I see your reaction, I will start uh, the whole thing again. So, you know, and you, uh, because I'm Russian, I have inf infinite patience and, you know, and persistence. So, there will be uh, more and more tries. So, and, you know, uh, I think I, everyone deserves an anecdote now. I ha don't have one, but I'm, uh, I have to then introduce myself. Vladimir Rybinin, Executive Secretary of the Intergovernmental Shangraphic Commission of UNESCO, which uh, 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 the variation is IOC, not to be mixed with the International Olympic Committee, but I think we are really trying to do something that is of the same scale for the ocean and really deserves that. So, do we have any, any sound? Okay, now I keep speaking. I mean, let me let, let me be counting. So what is going? What's happening? There seems to be a slight delay uh, when you speak and when the sounds come out. So a few seconds. I think ah. it's okay. All right. So now let me have an explanation for you. There is some delay when I speak and and and, and when you hear what I say. So we have to bear with that. There is no other choice. So, uh, uh, the, you know, probably most of you attended the plenary, the opening plenary. What is my take home message from the plenary? There are a lot of heroes, there are a lot of attempts, there are a lot of initiatives, but everything depends on science. And uh, everything depends on having common solutions and a platform for these common solutions. So the Decade of Ocean Science is going to offer a systematic platform for seeking solutions, bringing together people, money, resources, ideas towards systematic processing of information and spitting out solutions in the many domains, including climate, including biodiversity, including economy, uh, uh, affecting uh, people's livelihoods in the positive sense, avoiding poverty, and, uh, and because of that, it is very important that everyone engages in this process, becomes a part of this, because solutions are coming for everyone, and this is a revolution in ocean science. So, I would like to introduce now the moderator of this session, Julian Barbier, who is a head of section in IOC, but his important role now is that he is the coordinator of the Ocean Science Decade for Sustainable Development. Julian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Vladimir. Good to see you all. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, it's a real pleasure to see real people in front of us today. We spend 18 months in front of a computer and, and sometimes this interaction we've been missing very much. And I hope that this will really help us to achieve our goals both in the decade and the biodiversity agenda. So our event today is really to first familiarize you with uh, the goals of a decade, the ocean decade, which just started a few months ago. But really see how we can articulate this and support the whole global biodiversity and conservation agenda. So today we have a great speakers with us who will uh, give you some of the uh, different dimensions of this, uh, of this dialogue. 
will address the issue of uh, the post-2020 global biodiversity agenda, which is still going to be negotiated uh, next year. Again, what is the science need? How can science support the effective design and implementation of FBAs, for example? We have a global initiative, 30 by 30, uh, which really aims to uh, get 30% of the ocean uh, under some level of conservation. Again, what are the tools, what are the data that we need uh, to, to achieve these goals? Uh, and of course, we have uh, the high seas. Uh, 43% of the surface of the Earth is the high seas. We have a UNGA uh, negotiation next year also uh, on this new legally uh, binding agreement. Uh, so we will hear about this and, and try to understand uh, where we are in terms of our existing knowledge. We'll try to sum up and also really understand how we can develop this new way of implementing science in a co-design uh, and working with end users towards the delivery of knowledge and actions. So today we are you joining us physically. We also have a, a live uh, internet webcast uh, audience, and we hope to have a little bit of time at the end of the, of the interventions for, for some uh, for some Q and A. Uh, we will use the Slido uh, mechanism. So we have a hashtag Ocean Decade. If you are familiar with Slido, you can ask your questions there, and we, we will moderate them. But we will also try to get maybe a few live questions from um, from the audience. Uh, without further ado, uh, we'll, before we, we go into the, the panel, you need to have your inoculation for the decade. So we're going to give you a, a five minute shot so that you get a, a vision of what the decade is about, how you can engage, and how does it link with the biodiversity uh, agenda. And I can assure you there's no side effects to, to this. So over to uh, my colleague Alison who will uh, give you a, a bit of an overview of, uh, of a decade and then we go into the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so I am, thank you. It's lovely to be here this afternoon. The first live uh, speech I've given in a while. So it's a, it's a real pleasure. And welcome also to our streaming audience. This seems to be the, the future, these hybrid events. As Julian said, I don't want to take too much time. Um, we've got some amazing speakers lined up, but I think it's important that there is some basic knowledge about the decade. So first of all, why an ocean decade? Now we all know the ocean is in trouble, right? I think everybody is here at this Congress has that awareness. But you know, the, this quote really sums it up. We're actually running out of time to manage the ocean sustainably. We're also running out of time for the sustainable development goals. We're running out of time for all these other global aspirations about climate, about food security, and yet the ocean is central to all of these. Now, one thing that is true and that is a barrier to meeting any of these aspirations is that there is a lack of knowledge. There's a lack of science, there's a lack of co-designed, inclusive, solutions oriented knowledge. And that is what the decade is all about. Sorry, I'm doing microphones and turning slides. So the Ocean Decade basically grew out of discussions within the IOC in 2016 that really wanted to address this, this, this lack of knowledge. In 2017, more and more partners came on board. Uh, the UN General Assembly proclaimed the start of the decade, and we launched into a three-year participatory preparation phase. Now, this was in the days 2018 to 2020, where people could still get together. We had thousands of people in regional, national, international meetings around the world to design this decade. And what did that lead to? Well, you can see here, the vision of 10 years starting in 2021, where we are going to work together to generate the science we need for the ocean we want. The mission statement sums it up. It's all about transformative ocean science, solutions for sustainable development that connect people and our ocean. We need to change behavior. We need to change individual behavior. We need to change institutional behavior. The decade is going to do this through the decade action framework, which I, some of you who know the decade will be familiar with. We've been touting this on Zoom calls for the last two years now, where groups, if you start at the bottom, where groups of people all around the world will come together to co-design and to implement decade actions in the form of national, regional, international actions. These will work at all different steps of the ocean science value chain from the identification of knowledge, to the generation of knowledge, to the use of knowledge, to the building of the capacity to, to be able to use and apply ocean science. And this will respond to 10 major ocean decade challenges. These are the challenges that collectively we have set ourselves 
for ocean science for the next 10 years. And they range from pollution to ecosystems, to biodiversity, to climate, to the infrastructure we need for science, to capacity development, to behavior change. And you can see here this word cloud sums it up. It's about solutions, it's about transformative, it's about providing a framework for collective action over the next 10 years. So who is part of the decade so far? We have numerous partners. We've had a three-year preparation phase, nine months of implementation. We have planted the seeds of the ocean science revolution that Vladimir just mentioned. There are 24 national decade committees that are up and running, many more that are getting underway. We have seven major regional task forces from the Arctic to the Southern Ocean that are identifying the regional, the national priorities in ocean science needs for the next 10 years. We have the Ocean Decade Alliance, which is philanthropy, UN agencies, private sector, governments coming together to help us mobilize the resources. And at a very concrete level, we have 34, our first 34 global decade programs of which we have representatives here today on the panel in the audience who are, represent hundreds of partners across the globe who have committed time, energy and resources to carrying out the first building blocks of transformative ocean science. 16 of these programs have a strong biodiversity and ecosystem focus. They have mobilized and leveraged already 800 million US dollars for ocean science and they have an ambition over the next three years alone to leverage two billion more. So you can see we're not talking about something small, we're talking about global ambition but a very necessary global ambition. My last slide then, if you're convinced, how can you get involved in the ocean decade? Well, it's a great time to be hearing this because October this year is a big month for the ocean decade. We have two big um, new ways of getting involved that are really going to make it easier for, for, for the decade really to become everyone's decade, as we, as we say. We have a global stakeholder forum which will be launched in mid-October, which is the place that everybody can come together, collaborate, exchange, work in communities of practice, join decade programs, incubate ideas for the decade. So keep an eye on our, on our website and you'll see uh, information soon on how to join this global stakeholder forum. We're calling it the LinkedIn for the ocean decade and we've seen some test runs. It's fabulous. I think you'll really, really appreciate the, the, the collaborative nature of the forum. And then we have our next Call for Decade Actions. The 34 programs that I mentioned to you came through a first Call for Decade Actions. We have a second Call for Decade Actions, which will be launched in October, where we will be asking partners around the world to submit projects and programs, ideas to become part of the Ocean Decade. So we hope you will join us in the global ocean science revolution and create the science we need for the ocean we want by 2030. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alison. So now I, I hope with this information you are all up to gear with what the decade is and basically a global framework for prioritizing our needs and our investment in ocean knowledge. Right, now let's go into the substance of our panel. Uh, our first segment is really to see how the decade really articulates with the overall, um, the, the overall global biodiversity framework and in particular the CBD uh, agenda. So to talk about this, we have uh, Dr. David Obura, who is the founding uh, director of Cordio East Africa. Cordio is a knowledge organization supporting sustainability of coral reef and marine systems in the, in the region. And his primary research focus is on coral reef resilience, in particular uh, climate change. And of course, David has been uh, supporting many scientific process, the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network, uh, the, the Global Ocean Observing System, Biology and Ecosystem Panels, amongst a few. So let me start with a, a first question for you, uh, David, because you're clearly well familiar with the decade, but you've also been involved in the uh, post-2020 uh, framework. Uh, and, 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 and as you know, the ocean decade recognizes the importance of measuring progress and ev evaluating impact over, over the next 10 years. So from your perspective, where do you see the, the synergies uh, between those two processes and how really the decade could, uh, could facilitate that process? And you'll use uh, the next mic, which is clean. <laughs> thank you. Over to you. All right. Thank you, Julian. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, OK, great. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for inviting me on this session. As, as you said, I have been very much involved in um, coral reef monitoring around the world, or so in Kenya and East Africa in my region, but also globally. And through that, 
become involved in the, the GOOSE, the Global Ocean Observing System process of establishing global monitoring networks and global observing systems. The um, GEOBON, the, uh, the Group on Earth Observations Biodiversity Observation Network also has a marine program. And all of this, the purpose of doing this is really to feed uh, data into convention processes so we understand the ocean, we know its state, uh, and can report on it effectively. And so with the global biodiversity framework under the CBD being negotiated currently, it also has a huge process right now to identify relevant indicators to understand the state of biodiversity uh, across the planet. Of course, a lot of the focus is on terrestrial areas, but there's also, of course, very strong oceans components. And, and uh, so both processes have actually undergone very detailed and very extensive consultations over the last few years. While the COVID process has, of course, you know, locked us all down and away from what we normally do for 18 months, it's actually provided additional time for technical processes to catch up in a way. And so I think that now we're in a better place for understanding how we can monitor and evaluate these two processes and how the decade can really support the ongoing processes under the convention uh, over the next 10 years. Great, thank you. So as you know, the decade is, is a global initiative and of course it's very important that uh, you know, it's inclusive and all regions of the world uh, have the means to, to participate and, and benefit from, from the output. So from your experience, particularly in, in Africa, what, what might be the, um, the barriers, but also possibly the opportunities uh, for uh, countries to access uh, you know, biodiversity data and, and, and use this data for, for informing management and conservation efforts? Yes, yeah, so there's, there's certainly, um, so looking at the next 10 years, priorities for the decade, well, it's nine years now, of course, because we're, we're sort of, um, you know, the, the time has been running away with us with, with COVID. Um, but, and as COVID has shown us, the networking of people together is, is a huge challenge. So particularly in Africa and other parts of the world, there's, there's a huge digital divide. There's a lot of challenges around being able to, you know, even just access the internet and get onto sessions like this, participate remotely. Um, but it also counts for data as well, accessing data, where there's a lot of global data that's available, particularly on atmospheric and, and physical ocean variables. Um, but actually accessing that for African countries is, is very hard. So I think those two things are really, I think, critically important uh, as priorities for the decade to really build up as one is building up the data networks, the infrastructure around being able to share data. And I think that is, of course, one of the priorities of the decade with the Ocean Info Hub being developed. And the second thing is then building the capacities for countries to participate in that infrastructure because if it's no use it being there if people can't participate in it. And of course that needs trained personnel, uh, it needs more equipment, it needs a lot more sort of sharing programs um, and capacity building uh, and training. And then the other thing that's really critically important that I think the, the decade can help really emphasize is that when it comes to monitoring information to understand uh, the state of the ocean, you need regular money. You, it's not enough just to build up a program, have two years of training or put in an institution or some, some equipment. You also need to make sure that you have sustainable financing for salaries and for ongoing expenses and things like that. So I think that's, that's another area that certainly from an African perspective, that's, that's a big priority. Great, the whole issue of sustainability again. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I will let you go because I know you need to run on the, to the other side of, uh, of the conference venue, but you will be back uh, at okay. the end of the session for the Q&A. So thanks thank again, you, Daniel, thank David. You. And uh, we'll just uh, then uh, move on on our agenda and we're gonna hear from uh, the Convention of Biological Diversity, in particular, our so colleague uh, Joseph Apiot, who could not be with us uh, today, but uh, sent us a, a, a pre-recorded video he is the coordinator of the Marine and Coastal and Island Biodiversity Program of, uh, of the CBD. So if we could please just have the, uh, the video. Thank you. Greetings from Montreal, Canada, the, the birthplace of professional ice hockey and Celine Dion, but most importantly, the home of the Secretary to the Convention on Biological Diversity. My name is Joe Appiat, and I coordinate the work on marine, coastal, and island biodiversity here at the CBD Secretariat. I regret sincerely that I can't be there with you in Marseille due to the pandemic, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to address this event remotely. But staying at home also gives me more time with my newborn son, Lionel. In addition to a newfound appreciation for sleep, Lionel's arrival has also deepened my desire to keep the ocean healthy and well-functioning for him and future generations. 
Under the CBD, our parties and stakeholders are working together to do just this for biodiversity through the development of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. This framework, which will be submitted for adoption at CBD COP15 next year, will contain a new set of global goals and targets for biodiversity. The lack of up-to-date information on the status and trends of biodiversity was a primary contributor to the failure to fully achieve the IG biodiversity targets. And nowhere is this challenge more pronounced than in the ocean. The fact that the launching of the UN Decade on Ocean Science coincides with the development of the post-2020 framework provides us with perhaps a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to address this challenge, to further break down silos among our different areas of work, and to catalyze synergies to get the ocean data that we all need. This is crucial not only for setting strong goals and targets, but to carrying these into reality through implementation and to understanding whether our efforts are moving us in the right direction or not. With that, Lionel, will, Lionel and I will pass off to our good friend David Obura and wish you all a productive meeting. Say bye-bye. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Joseph and uh, Le Leona, uh, for this, uh, this, um, this uh, very nice message. Uh, certainly, we look forward to, to working with the CBD in the coming months in, uh, in supporting the, the, the agenda and, and really trying to, to see how the, the science can, can really deliver uh, the right tools for conservation. Now, we are going to be going to our next speaker and um, we're going to talk about the 30 by 30 initiative, uh, which is a, a global initiative uh, about conserving 30% of uh, ocean areas. And in particular, the theme of what knowledge do we need for enhanced uh, area-based management. So it's my pleasure to invite Geneviève uh, Pons, who is the Director General and Vice President of EGD, of Europe Jacques Delors. She has been um, part of uh, Jacques Delors' cabinet in the, uh, in the 90s, being a climate and environmental advisor. Had taken several positions with UN and, and NGOs and, and now as of today she's been appointed as the head of Europe Jacques Delors and uh, which is the, the latest in the family of think tanks carrying on Jacques Delors European vision. So welcome uh, Geneviève. My, my first question is to could you please give us a bit of an overview of uh, this, this 30 by 30 initiative and in particular how does it actually link with the, uh, the overall CBD agenda, but also the BBNJ process. Uh, and maybe you can give us some example of what's happening in the Antarctic, where we already heard quite a bit about this today. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Julian, and uh, very happy to be with you today. Um, 3030 is a call to action to protect at least 30% of our ocean by 2030 through the creation of a network of marine protected areas. It is science-based. Science and experience show that when you protect a marine area, life is coming back quickly. I am a diver and I've seen with a lot of sadness very depleted areas and then a few years later, thanks to good protection, they were thriving again and life was coming back which means not only a benefit to biodiversity but also a benefit to climate because we know more and more the narrow link between uh, biodiversity and climate and the rich marine zone has the capacity to absorb carbon and emit uh, oxygen so this is what it is about uh, it was launched by a resolution of the IUCN in 2016. It is now endorsed by nearly 100 states in the world. It, it, is, it has become one of the key targets of the CBD, the Convention on Biodiversity, um, and especially for the post-2020 framework. And we hope that in the next months after at, at Kunmin, it will be endorsed. It is also absolutely key for the success of the BBNG. 
The BBNG, it's biodiversity beyond borders. It is now, it is now being negotiated. And uh, most people don't know that this high sea, which is more than half of the ocean, is not protected. Only 1% of this huge area is highly to fully protected. So there is a lot of work to do, and this also will be negotiated in the next months. Finally, it is extremely important for Antarctica. Antarctica is, is a zone which is very far away, so a lot of people don't know how Antarctica is important for their own life, for our biodiversity, for our climate. Antarctica represent 90% of the ice of the earth, 70% of fresh water, and a very powerful stream is around Antarctica that sends life all around. So we need to protect Antarctica for our biodiversity and for our climate. It is absolutely key. There are three areas that are proposed one in East Antarctica, one in the Weddell Sea, and one in West Antarctica. And these proposals are supported by most of the members of the relevant commission, the CAMLAR, except for two, China and Russia. And I had the occasion yesterday to speak with President Macron and tell him that it is now the time to act. The France, as well as the EU, have been very great supporters of this protection. And now this year will be very special because France will take the lead of the European Union, giving it even more power, and China will host the CBD Convention. So these are two reasons why this year is absolutely key to get Antarctica protection. And finally, maybe I should say a word about Ocean Unite. Ocean Unite unites many people around, around the globe for the protection of our ocean. And this 3030 objective, it is at the core of our action, including in Antarctica. Thank you very much. It was actually quite heartwarming to hear this morning the, the DG environment commissioner to also uh, you know call for this uh, this target to be um, to be achieved so we, we wish you uh, luck in, in more than luck but uh, you i hope we will be able to mobilize uh, support now uh, another question that i wanted to ask you is you know from your perspective what, what are the key ocean knowledge needs to that, that are required to achieve this target C can you say maybe a, a bit more about this well uh I, I would say that there are some countries that are not able, that have not the capacity mm -hmm. to know what biodiversity is in their waters. They have not this capacity. So international cooperation could help them identify the areas in their marine territories that should be protected. This is the first link uh, between knowledge and protection. Then I would like to take once again the example of Antarctica. Antarctica has been made a continent for science and peace by the treaty, Antarctic Treaty, which was signed in 1959. And through the protection of this area, we can gain a lot of knowledge. And we have, there is a specificity, there are many specificities concerning Antarctica. It is far away, it is very difficult to get there, it is very costly to get there, and so international cooperation is particularly important to not only get there, but to have common science coming from this part of, the, of our common planet. Right, thank you very much, Geneviève. We'll, um, we'll, we'll take you. on some questions later on and thank again you. remind the audience that uh, we'll have a bit of time for live questions as well as a uh, question on Slido. Now, the next segment is uh, focusing on uh, how to enhance knowledge to support the high seas conservation and management. We have a, an international negotiation which has been 15 years in the making. Uh, hopefully we will get a, a critical uh, step next year in terms of mm -hmm. getting the legally binding uh, uh, agreement for the conservation of the high seas. 
what do we need for in terms of a science? Do we have the right scientific and technical mechanisms to, to advise uh, the implementation of such a treaty? Before we go to you, uh, Guillermo, we're just going to hear very briefly from uh, one of our IUCN colleagues, Christina Gierde, who is a senior high seas advisor to IUCN's Global Marine and Polar Program. She's been the voice of IUCN in the uh, BBNJ negotiation, and she also sits on the Decade uh, advisory, Interim Advisory Board uh, that's been helping in, in preparing and implementing the Decade. So let's hear from Christina. Greetings. The United Nations de Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development offers a vital opportunity to collectively ensure that decisions on how we use, protect, and manage two-thirds of our planet are based on the science, knowledge, and indeed the humility we need in the face of a rapidly changing ocean. The Ocean Decade is well-timed to also support the evolving UN Treaty for the Conservation and Sustainable Use of marine biodiversity and the 60% of the ocean that lies beyond national boundaries. Core components of this treaty will be conservation tools such as marine protected area networks and connectivity corridors, environmental impact assessments that reflect an understanding of direct cumulative and climate change related effects, equitable access and sharing benefits of marine genetic resources combined with capacity and transfer of marine technologies to enable all to equitably participate. Thus, the BBNJ agreement and the UN Decade of Ocean Science are mutually supportive and indeed interdependent. For this reason, I urge all with a stake in ocean health to join in crafting robust decadal research projects and promoting an ambitious high seas treaty. For both are essential to safeguard our shared global ocean commons for the benefit of present and future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now let me go to Guillermo Ortuno Crespo, who is a, a marine ecologist with a doctorate from Duke University. He now works uh, at the Stockholm Resilience Center and of course uh, Guillermo has been uh, a member of the early career professional program of the UN Decade, I would say from the start basically. You've been one of our founding members of that, of that uh, excellent program. So Guillermo, can you tell us a little bit about what are the critical missing uh, pieces of information and knowledge when it comes to uh, the BBNJ and, and, and you know, that are going to be somehow uh, defining the scope of this BBNJ agreement? Yeah, certainly. Thank you, Julian. And hello, everyone. Um, I'm assuming uh, Christine has provided some inoculation of BBNJs, so you might be familiarized with some of the elements of the new treaty. Uh, if you're not, um, there are four elements, uh, two of which are quite data intensive, I would say. We have uh, one of the pillars of the BBNJ treaty that focuses on environmental impact assessments, and the other one focuses on area-based management tools. Uh, I'm a spatial ecologist by training. So the area-based management tool portion of the treaty is uh, very dear to me. I've spent lots of hours trying to figure out what we need to know about the spatial and temporal distribution of biodiversity in order to, to protect it. The treaty comes at a critical time as human beings were expanding further and deeper into the ocean than ever before. Uh, the depth at which we're fishing, both pelagic and demersal gears, we're going deeper to catch uh, different species across the food chain. One thing that we have not done a good job at doing in this last 70 years of expansion is documenting what we're catching. Uh, we don't have proper baseline information. So this new treaty is filling a governance gap that the law of the sea left behind. We don't have a mechanism, an official mechanism to establish area-based management tools in the high seas. But now that we're creating one, the question is, do we have enough knowledge across sufficient species in space and time to implement these measures? Um, I am finalizing a study together with colleagues at Duke University, University of Queensland, uh, supported by IUCN, I should say, uh, that uses data from the Ocean Biodiversity Information System housed at UNESCO. Uh, it's, they, they host the most comprehensive repository of high seas data in the world, uh, over six million records, and we analyze that to see what the spatial, temporal, and taxonomic distribution of data is. We do not have enough knowledge in the high seas, not even close. Uh, we do have 6.2 million records. 10% um, of the species account for 62% of all the, all the data. Uh, the top 0.1% of species account for 40% of the data. 
It's very skewed taxonomically to the species that we know well, uh, some in the Southern Ocean, some in the Northeast Atlantic. Uh, geographically, we have huge, huge gaps in, uh, in the tropics, in the Pacific, um, and most of the data that we know come from pelagic species. Um, quite surprisingly, um, we are not doing a good job at bringing data, connecting data streams. Opus doesn't have access to data generated by RFMOs, for instance. Uh, so we're, we, there's an opportunity through the Ocean Decade not only to generate new knowledge, but to encourage national governments to share whatever knowledge they have. Um, the answer is no, I'm afraid. I don't think we have enough data to even consider establishing comprehensive air-based management tools in most of the high seas. Now, some folks might say the Northeast Atlantic, we do have data, or the Southern Ocean or the Antarctic Peninsula, we do have data. So we do have hotspots, but for the most part, unfortunately, we do not. And just one statistic uh, from this paper that will hopefully come out soon. We split the high seas into one by one degree cells. So 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers. The percentage of the high seas that have less than 100 records, 100 species records, is 70%. So 70% of the high seas, we don't have more than 100 records in the whole time series of OBIS. So no, we don't have data, but the UN Decade of Ocean Science can hopefully change that. Uh, we have to capitalize on, on those who are out there, shipping, fishing industry, governments are out there, and really increase our knowledge if we want a successful BBNJ treaty. Thanks very much. Now, of course, that also links up to the issue of capacity development and technology transfer, which is also another uh, core area of a negotiation of a treaty. So from your perspective, I mean, how can we, you know, we have this negotiation coming up uh, next year. How do we make sure that, uh, you know, the science is at the heart of the treaty and, and, and that, you know, we have a, the right advisory mechanism to, to drive the definition and the implementation of marine protected areas in the ICs? What would you be your advice to, to scientists, for example, who are interacting with, with, uh, with their governments? I, I don't know that my advice would be to scientists at this stage of negotiations. We, we're not that present in the negotiation, negotiating room. We normally sit at the back, and uh, we do get to participate every so often. Um, I think the elephant in the room for successful implementation is how this new instrument, which we agreed was not going to undermine existing bodies, it was not going to under undermine RFMOs, it was not going to undermine the International Seabed Authority or the IMO. How are these instruments from a legal perspective? That's when we need to bring the forward-thinking lawyers, how are they going to interact? Because if, we, if BBNJ has a mandate to establish MPAs, but the ISA, the IMO, and RFMOs do not recognize those MPAs, we have nothing. So I, I think that's where uh, being more transparent about the legal mandates of each body so that they can interlock and work together as opposed to undermine each other is where we need to be placing our focus, I think, at the, this negotiation Great. stage. Just one last word very quickly. Can you say a little bit more about the engagement of early carrier ocean professionals in this, in this process? Um, it's been limited, I would say. I think over the last five years, I've been able to participate in some of these conferences. I've been one of the lucky ones. Pure chance that the lab where I did my PhD had connections with the CBD, um, with the ISA and, and, and other UN processes. Uh, we need to start training the next generation of ocean professionals so that they can both generate science and policy briefs. They need to be able to translate in both directions, and that takes time. I've been attending these negotiations for five years, more or less and I'm still learning about when to speak, when to share knowledge, with whom, uh, so that they can, it can be used strategically to advance the text negotiation. So um, maybe I've seen 10, 15 early career professionals in total. So we need national delegations having it, should try to bring in the next generation of ocean leaders into, into these negotiations to learn. Very, very good, thank you very much. Clearly BBNJ is about defining the ocean governance probably for the next 40 to 50 years. So. I think it's important that all generations get involved in that process. Okay, now let's go to, um, thank you very much, Guillermo. So our last segment is really trying to, to summing up and, and in particular, why we need co-design inclusive and transformative ocean knowledge solution uh, to achieve a biodiversity so goals. Yeah. Um, okay. Before we go to my next speaker, we have one more little video, video and this is from uh, the Gr Great Barrier Reef Foundation, uh, the chief scientist, no, Professor Uwe uh, Goldberg, who is uh, an internationally acclaimed marine scientist and uh, leading decade, author on coral reef uh, science and conservation. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go over to yeah. Uwe and then we so go to, to, to our speaker. The ocean is one of the great reservoirs of biodiversity on our planet. 
providing habitat for hundreds of thousands of species, many of which are still undescribed by science. Despite the importance of these species, however, ocean biodiversity is declining at an alarming rate and will have catastrophic consequences if we don't turn it around. If we don't do anything, we will face an increasingly dangerous and unstable world. And this is why the UN Decade for Ocean Science is so important and why we must seek science-based answers to turn this situation around. We need to know how we can use the Ocean Decade to galvanise a global effort to reverse the tide of habitat degradation and biodiversity loss. We also need to develop innovative solutions that are co-designed with those who need the knowledge to make the critical decisions at the local, regional and global scales. And this effort will need to be turbocharged in terms of innovation, such as we're doing at the Great Barrier Reef Foundation through the world's largest uh, coral reef grants program. And most of all, we must be bold. Time is running out. And finally, we need to know where we're going and what success will look like at the end of the ocean decade in 2030. Hopefully, we'll have a reinvigorated ocean that's bursting with life and opportunity again. I hope and I believe so. Thank you. Now let's go to our next speaker, Dr. Mathieu Colletet, who is an agronomic engineer specializing in, uh, in fishery science. Um, Mathieu works as a, focuses on uh, you know, small scale fishers in industry and particularly how they, they integrate within larger European fisheries policies. He is involved in the Ocean Nexus International Research Program, which is hosted by the Institut National Polytechnique and the, and the Institut du Développement Durable pour les Relations Internationales, l'IDRI. And he's also a member of the Ocean Voices Ocean Decade Program. So, uh, Matthew, why is ocean science such an important part of the solution to achieve global and regional biodiversity goals? Can you give us some examples of critical gaps in ocean science and knowledge that are impairing our ability to achieve those goals? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for, for the invitation uh, and for the opportunity to speak today about uh, ocean science uh, and the Ocean Voices Decade program uh, that is supported by the Ocean Nexus Center I'm part of. Uh, first, I think it's important to note that ocean science uh, includes a great variety of disciplines. I mean, we, absolutely, we are talking about oceanography, biology, ecology, that provide very important data to monitor, etc. But we also talk about uh, social sciences and humanities that are key to tackle equity issues and to design uh, more inclusive approaches of designing and conducting uh, marine science. Uh, and so we all know that the ocean it represents 90% of the, of the volume that life, life can, uh, uh, can support. Uh, and so it's, uh, uh, biodiversity there plays a, a vital role in maintaining the productivity, the resilience of ecosystems. Uh, and so marine biodiversity with the multiple stressors, stressors we know, uh, be it climate change, pollution, uh, transportation, overfishing, uh, and so ocean science in all its diversity is key really uh, to to, to monitor, but also to develop these solution-based approaches we are, we are asking for. Uh, and so there are, there are different uh, important gaps, but I think one, one gap that we really identify within the Ocean Voices program uh, is the need to better understand the needs and the priorities of ocean-dependent people uh, and evaluate potential solutions for them. Uh, Gerald Singh, Hyatt Arden Davis, and other colleagues from the Ocean Nexus program uh, wrote uh, at the beginning of the year uh, an opinion paper entitled uh, um, Will Understanding the Ocean Lead to the Ocean We Want? And it's a bit too echo the, the, the phrase of the, of the decades. And, and the, the, they really outlined that uh, science does not inherently lead to sustainable or unsustainable or equitable or unequitable outcomes. It really depends on uh, how, where, when, and by whom, by whom the science is going to be either funded, conducted, and used. And so uh, there is a need to really consider explicitly the leaving no one behind uh, commitment of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and that's, that's really because otherwise you may have scientific solutions that may lead to unsustainable or unequitable outcomes. Uh, and so in our opinion, solution-oriented research 
is really a key uh, uh, to is really a key and a, a critical gap to fill uh, to achieve uh, collective goals that are being set. I think a, a second element is that uh, uh, we need to develop approaches that are really responsive to diversity, that are inclusive, uh, and being conscious not to decouple this from the political economy. So we should really aim for a renewed dialogue between all communities, ocean communities, ocean stakeholders, and, and, and to work across the science, ocean science policy interface. And an example, an iconic example, a very important one, is for example, gender equality and equity, because it's part of the principle of good governance. Uh, it's, it's recognized, and within fisheries, uh, it's critical for effective uh, mm -hmm. governance. Uh, and so, for example, within the Ocean Nexus program, we got a project called Gendered Inequities in Ocean Restoration. It investigates uh, structural power asymmetries in the rehabilitation of coastal nature. And so this is, for example, crucial research that needs to be uh, uh, done to achieve these collective goals. Great, thank you very much. So, so it's all about co-design and, and co-delivery. Can you maybe identify some, uh, some factors of success that, that can really help us to, to do that? Because yeah. we talk a lot about it, but concretely, what does it mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the whole process, uh, not only for, I mean, for everybody, but also a lot for the scientific community to think about the research we do and how we do it. And, and I think to be successful, co-design ocean science needs a, a refined understanding of the actors involved, uh, of their culture, of the well-being, uh, and how power dynamics and decision-making processes uh, influence our oceans. So developing strategies, governance frameworks, and enabling conditions to improve equity uh, and inclusiveness in the design conduct of science uh, will be key to leave no one behind, to leave no one behind as, uh, as uh, committed in the, in the SDGs. And so the Ocean Voices program led by Harriet Arden Davis uh, we'll conduct research, incubate ideas, facilitate discussions, uh, conveying capacity building partnerships to advance equity within the decade. Uh, and, and we really aim to do this uh, uh, and stimulate discussions across disciplinary, sectoral and geographical boundaries. Uh, and so that's, yeah, that's our aim and to really also focus on this solution-oriented research. Uh, if we achieve this objective, that would be quite successful. So, yeah, that's... that's yeah, let's go back to work. All right, it's a different way of doing business. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, a lot. Uh, Thanks. Mathieu, and, and please stay with us. We'll, uh, we're now going to go into the Q&A session. So we have a Slido where, uh, you know, our webcast uh, audience can certainly uh, post questions, but we can also take a live question from, uh, from the audience. Maybe before I, I, I see there's some Slido questions coming up here. Uh, and also this, yes, Vladimir, you are one of a person that can also answer the question. So if you have questions about the decade, don't hesitate. We have our executive secretary here with us. Um, let me just ask uh, if there are any questions in the audience uh, live before we go to the, to the uh, yes, I see the gentleman here. Somebody. You'll need to speak into the micro, even if, uh, even if you can't really hear yourself, it's for the streaming. If you could please introduce yourself and, and then ask your question. Yeah, my name is Ralf Sonntag. I'm with the World Future Council in Germany. And first of all, I would like to thank you, the pres presenters. It was some very nice and very interesting presentations. And um, I mean, my, my impression is that, of course, we need much more science. We need a lot more science to understand the oceans. We only have very little of this. But I think we do have enough science to know that the oceans have a problem right now and that the problem is growing and that we need to act. So I really think the Im very important thing is that we have now political action, that politicians around the world agree to the BBNJ treaty and politicians around the world agree to the 30 by 30. I think those are the key issues and uh, which we should start right now. Thank you. Okay, so more, I guess, a commentary. Uh, from our audience. Any, anybody else would like to, to pose a, a, a question? You didn't hear the question? This, this was not a question, it was more like a comment. Okay, so you're off the hook for the time being. <laughs> a anybody else? Okay, uh, I have a couple of questions from uh, Slido. 
Uh, well, first, uh, Geneviève, you will have a question because somebody is asking about how can we find out more about Ocean Unite. So maybe you can take a minute to, to mention that. A uh, question related to data. Uh, I don't know. Oh, we have a live question. Let's take the, the live questions. Uh, if we can please pass on the mic. Thank you very much, uh, François Galgani from IFREMER. I'm part of the mission board for the mission Starfish. And the question is about uh, how, how do you will harmonize the program of Ocean Decan within different countries? You did have regional initiatives already to set up recommendation and set up the program then. But I mean, will there be not be any difference in the way to solve the problem and involve, in, I mean, involve scientists in the uh, decade and so on? And what could be the role of uh, uh, we say uh, regional initiatives such as the mission Starfish from European Commission, for instance. I think it could help, and we may, I mean, uh, harmonize both uh, probably somewhere. Thank you. So, mission Starfish, I see you <laughs> I have, a, I have a client here. So, Geneviève will, uh, will, will make the link between the, um, you know, the decade and, and the prioritization. Thank you very much. I, 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 I think uh, Vladimir is already aware, but th there is a, a strong similarity between the ocean decade that has been launched at international level uh, and uh, the mission on restoring ocean and waters uh, that has been launched at European level and that has led to the adoption of the Starfish 2030 mission, mission report. Uh, François Galgani uh, from IFREMER is part of this uh, uh, of the team that created that. And we have called our report Starfish 2030 because we have a central objective, which is restoring our ocean and waters. And then we have five ways to get there. And one of the main ways that we could call the first way absolutely necessary is to fill the knowledge and emotional gap. Uh, it's far from our sight sometimes, ocean, and far from our heart. Not for me. I was born nearly in the ocean, and uh, it is uh, deep in my heart. But this is, this is not the case of everybody. And, and science shows that the emotional gap is, m most of all, a knowledge gap. So one of the main aim of the Starfish 2030 mission will be to fill this knowledge gap. So we are fully in line with ocean decade, not only for the timing, because our aim is 2030, but also for the core objective. So we need to work together. Right, thank you very much, Genevieve. I have a question here which relates to, uh, to data, which is also an essential element. We know that you know, there's a lot of data out there which is not being used, which is sitting in, in, in drawing, uh, in drawers and uh, in, in databases. So what, what digital or data-related actions are really needed to, to enable the, the transformation that the, the DKD is trying to achieve? Maybe uh, Guillermo or Mathieu, would you like to, uh, sure. to give you some ideas? Just some brief comments, um, sort of reflecting on some of the previous comments I made. I think there's a need to uh, connect existing databases. Uh, sometimes the most attractive thing is to find a pot of money to coin a new acronym. We are drowning in acronyms. We have plenty of acronyms. We have plenty of uh, intergovernmental, international data repositories and we need to maintain those. Right now, uh, the Ocean Biodiversity Informa Information System, which is comprised of geographic nodes and thematic nodes, is severely underfunded. So uh, I think that uh, funding what the infrastructure that we've already created, it would be a good first step. But also, like I mentioned, uh, Opus doesn't have access to a lot of existing data that is housed in hard drives within national uh, governments, within intergovernmental bodies. So let's align what we already have, and then we have a much clearer understanding geographically, taxonomically, where the decade can invest its, its uh, resources. Thank you very much. And, and maybe just to add one point on this, it's, it's not only we need more data, it's also we need this data to be shared more equitably, because at, the, at this point in time, marine knowledge is not equitably shared, and, and this is of particular concern when 
you know, a lot of coastal people, and especially in least developed countries or small island developing states, are the ones that are the most in danger uh, in future changes of the ocean. So we need this data also to be more equitably shared, so to be able to reach a lot of people in a lot of countries. And I, I will uh, like to add that we propose a digital twin of the ocean and waters. And this will be common knowledge, but also commonly build knowledge. And we will develop applications that will allow people, citizens, to take part of this knowledge building. Let me also ask uh, Vladimir, who also has his vision of what the data should uh, should be. You know, uh, I think uh, my, my response will be quite peculiar because I haven't heard the question, I haven't heard the previous answers. What only thing I know is that was Julian said, and and this is exactly an illustration of that people need to know to act, but sometimes you don't need. Uh, so the situation is that it's not only the quality and the quantity of the data that we need. The data makes all decisions much more transparent. Excuse me, this world is corrupted. And decisions are taken not because of the objective reasons. So we have to create a data system that brings to the decision makers not only the chance to take good decisions, but also to be verified on those decisions. And the science can do this. That is the best in, uh, answer to, the, to this question, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, another question I have here. How will Decade actively support co-design? That's something I'm not uh, allowed to answer the questions. How can... <laughs> How will Decade actually support co-design? You want to you answer go? that one? Huh? You no. could that well, one. no, I know, but <laughs> I'm the moderator, so <laughs> I can't do... I mean, we have to play the role here. Alison, you want to talk about co-design? How will the Decade support co-design? Yeah. Thank you. I see I got <laughs> thrown that question. <laughs> Okay, well, I think, you know, we have some fabulous partners. Um, we have the Ocean Voices program. We have several other endorsed decade programs that are really focusing on this issue of co-design. Last year, we had a series of six or seven regional workshops, webinars, and some global sessions that started to look within each region, what are the obstacles and the barriers to co-design? And a lot of it just comes down to understanding what co-design actually means, because when you break it down, it's not that complicated. So we're developing some training courses there will be curriculum on a on an online platform the ocean teacher global academy towards the end of the year that will gradually be adapted to different regions to different languages and so on so people can start to learn and then we'll be working with partners such as the ocean voices program to to build on that training program to do some publications where we're working with partners to also mobilize um, resources for seed funding so that groups can come together groups that wouldn't normally talk can come together and incubate different actions through co-design processes. So about capacity and bringing people together. And what I have the mic because I stole it. So I would like to say one important thing that, you know, we are bringing together people. We are bringing together you with your understanding of the, of the mother nature, what needs to be done. This co-design is enabled by the decade and there is a movement. So everyone thinks about how to live better with the ocean and for the ocean or for the future. And that is manifested also in science. And that is the co-design we would like to achieve. Bring everyone on board. And if I may add a piece of information, we do have regional and national mechanisms for co-designing. We have national decade committees that are being established uh, around the world. We have 25 decade committees that have been established in the US, in Latin America, even in Africa and in the Pacific. So those are also uh, fora for discussing and identifying the scientific needs. We have regional task forces, working groups, working in the Mediterranean region, working in the, in the tropical Atlantic region and, and the, the South Pacific. So you can join and, and be part of that discussion. What we have, we coming close to, to our event. I see we have one live question and I have one last question related to ACOP. So let's go to the live question and then we'll, we'll wrap up and give the floor to, to Peter Thompson. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Antares Ramos from Puerto Rico. I'm a marine ecologist by trade, also a social scientist. Um, for the last 20 years, we keep on hearing how we need to have more social science involved. We keep on hearing about we need more data. The, our, you know, 
audience member here from Germany said we have enough data to actually start starting. An issue we have in Puerto Rico is we have enough data, at least for coral reefs, for example, but the population, it's really hard to get the message across, being even an island, so it's a great example. What, and I guess my question is, do we have any big picture uh, groups or, you know, is it part of the conversation? You know, we have the policy level, we, we have all the regulations in place, at least in Puerto Rico, but then we can never get to the right audience, we can never get the message, and we have that disparity between the scientists, the technical talk, and then the day-to-day. -day. So I guess I want would love to hear a bit more about that. Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. Unfortunately, <laughs> we need to, to wrap up and we need to give, to give the floor to the special envoy. Uh, but please stick around at the end of the, of the event. Yeah. We can certainly you know, interact and, and try to give you some answers. So uh, with this, it's my pleasure to invite uh, Ambassador Peter Thompson, UN Secretary General, Special Envoy for the Ocean, for a concluding remark on, the, on, on this event. Peter, over to you. Pleasure to see you again. Okay, I'll just do my advertisement first, but the lady from Puerto Rico, where are you? There. Uh, you know, I think the media, the media has to start getting responsible about ocean work. Uh, I had a meeting with BBC last week, actually, where the, the, the BBC was agreeing with me. Uh, this is a blind, been a blind spot for them. So you have to engage your media and get some champions in the Puerto Rican media. So that's to answer that. Look, I made a very nice speech before I came down here for this event. It's a beautiful speech and I'll give it to these guys. Uh, <laughs> so I think this is more of an interactive stage. Uh, and you've probably heard enough, I think, now about the UN Ocean Decade. And you've probably seen my branding enough. Okay, uh, so SDG 14, conserve and sustainably use the ocean's resources. All of our countries have agreed to it in 2015. Our job is to implement it. And so that's uh, my job as well. So look, first of all, uh, Alison, you better start jumping up and down when I've had my five minutes, okay? Because I've got no watch and no sense of time and it's hard to turn an ambassador off once you turn him on. So uh, maybe if you all leave the room when you've had enough, I'll know to stop speaking. But I want to just thank the organizers for putting this up. This is my home. This is where I'm born. This is where I'm brought up. I don't know what island this is, but I come from Fiji. I'm a fourth, fifth generation Fijian. My granddaughter, who is in my arms every morning, one of her ancestors has been living in these islands for 4,000 years. And this down here is our garden, right? We played as kids in the mangroves, in our tin boats. I spent a bit of time on the beach, not too much. This was our playground, what you're looking at here. As soon as you could swim, which is you know, four years old, and get a mask on, you came and you started exploring the backyard. And I can tell you that the uh, healthy coral reef is 100 times more colorful than what you're seeing here. Maybe it's a cloudy day, that's why. The shark is in light, but it was probably put in artificially. But anyway, uh, <laughs> what I want to say to you now is that so often when I go to these places now, I see a cemetery. I see the equivalent of a bombed out city after uh, you know, carpet bombing or something. It's so tragic. And uh, you all know the story of coral, so I won't go into that. But thanks for putting that up and giving me such a beautiful reminder of what it used to be like, and if we work hard enough, will be like for our children. Uh, you know, I'm, one of the reasons I put my speech aside is it's pretty much what I said this morning at the opening of the Ocean Plenary, and I think most of you were there. So uh, I did say there that I'm really here to spy on a hybrid conference, how to organize, because permit a little advertisement, the UN Ocean Conference is coming up in about nine months' time. Uh, 27th June to the 1st of July, don't quote me, it hasn't been mandated by the UN General Assembly yet, but if you work on that week, you be, uh, won't be wasting your time. So, uh, you know, the UN Ocean Conference, one of the first things I learned, because I got lost for half an hour trying to get here, and I saw this place yesterday to check, very hard to find. I didn't know it's in the Phoenician Pavilion, you know? So this is, uh, having been at hundreds of these conferences over the year, first thing, get your directions right for the users, us. And I apologize, Vladimir, that's a funny way of apologizing to you for being so late for this event. I've been around the perimeter about five times before I found you. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is that our host, the IUCN, um, Bruno said in his opening, we have two great challenges before us now, climate change and biodiversity loss. Where's the ocean in that? I didn't hear the ocean mentioned. 
uh, and yet it's measurably, scientifically, measurably in decline. The ocean, which supports us, surely that is uh, the third great challenge. And if you look at climate change, what is climate? Climate is the interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere. Am I correct, Vladimir? That is what climate is. So you, how can you talk about climate change without uh, talking about the ocean? You know, this is the driver of climate. And as I said, the ocean is in decline. Its health is in decline, measurably, scientifically measurable. And then you talk about biodiversity loss, where, you know, look at all these terrestrial people you're surrounded by, you know, terrestrials. You know, where is the great majority of life on this planet? 80 to 90 percent, I forget the figure. It's in the ocean. Diversity number of species, any way you want to measure it, it's all in the ocean. So that's why I never say the words, our oceans. Firstly, you never say plural, because the first principle of ocean literacy is there is one ocean, and that matters to us in the South Pacific, because the water coming off the Greenland ice sheet is sending up our sea levels here. It's one bathtub. So one ocean, the ocean. Thank you, President Macron, for the One Ocean Summit coming up very soon fantastic leadership from the French president and I never use the possessive our ocean who says you know when homo sapiens has long gone from this planet the ocean will still be there it'll be a lot more acidic thanks to our efforts but the ocean will still be there and there'll be a bunch of life creatures probably jellyfish or whatever who'll be sitting on the beach with sunglasses and saying hey, these guys used to call it their ocean yeah the ocean is still here so it's not our ocean, it's not our oceans, it's the ocean. We belong to it, it doesn't belong to us. Very important because when you get that in your head, a lot of things change in your thinking about life on this planet. So uh, there's another thing, we're cutting now. See, they're cutting me short and I've got a thousand things to tell you. But I want to, uh, okay, I'll give you one last thought then. Science, planning, finance. This is what Peter Hogan, the former chairman of uh, uh, the IOC, and uh, I and a couple of other people in Bergen, we sat down for a day brainstorming. We came up with that mantra. Science, planning, and finance. What does everybody want? Everybody wants some money to put in their windmills in the sea, to save their coral, to do their sustainable aquaculture, to make the shipping uh, renewable energy, etc. Right? This all takes trillions, trillions of dollars great. That's where we need to spend our trillions. We know we can spend it. We've seen that in COVID. But before those funds will be freed up to do that, we have to have really good plans in place. Really good plans. And that was the conclusion of the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy. That all of us, in all of our EEZs, have a responsibility to put in place sustainable ocean plans. And the 14 heads of government that are in the panel have agreed to do that by 2025, and they've asked all their peers, all the other heads of government, to do it by 2030. Why? Uh, because without it, nobody's going to give you money if you haven't got a decent plan in place. And you've got to do it all, obviously, environmentally correctly, and where the MPAs go, where the wind farms go, etc. The first part of the mantra, though, is science. We have to invest in good ocean science in order to have the right plans in place. So science, planning, and uh, the projects that come from that. That's the mantra. That's where the money needs to go. I've got meetings with Green Climate Fund, with Jeff. I've just met with Nora. To anybody who's got the money to put in, think of science, planning, finance. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Peter. And let me thank all our, our guest uh, panelists today. Thank you very much for this very interactive. Thank you to the audience. Uh, again, uh, we wish you a good day and apologies to the next panel who's coming after us. Uh, the IOC team is, is still around for the rest of the day, so if you want to, to talk to us, we're happy to, to, to talk about collaboration in the context of a decade. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. And I without headsets. Hi, everybody.